Today, this morning, it's a very special morning as the whole world celebrates Pentecost and we bring greetings and it's so wonderful to see our brothers and sisters all across the, you know, um, in Malaysia and also Brother Kenneth from uh, Canada to join in this wonderful time as we come together for another celebration. It has been over then 2,000 times, over 2,000 times the Feast of Pentecost has been celebrated all over the world. And uh, every time we celebrate, it marks that the coming of Jesus Christ is getting nearer and nearer. Uh, as the apostles were celebrating the Feast of Passover, because many of them were Jews at the time, uh, they still were celebrating the Feast of Passover. Uh, they remembered that the Lord was coming in their days. So if they were anticipating or looking forward for the coming of Jesus in their days, how much closer are we today than the days of the apostles? Praise God. Thank you again, Pastor Leah, for having us this morning. If you have the word, uh, the Bible with you, I want you to turn to the book of Exodus chapter 19. Verse 1, we are going to read verse 1 and also verse 3 and 4 and verse 6. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. Verse 3, if you read verse 3, the Bible says, And Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus say thou, say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, He have sent what I did, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptian, and how I bear you on eagle wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people from all the earth is mine and verse 6 says and he shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation praise God if you would look in the uh, history of the Jewish people uh, the Jewish people they celebrated seven feasts they had seven feasts of Israel every year so firstly the year will start off with the Feast of Passover, and then secondly, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, thirdly, the Feast of the First Fruit, then the Feast of Pentecost, which will be in the late May, in the last week of May, and, uh, and then the Feast of the Trumpets, the Feast of the Atonement, and finally, the Feast of the Tabernacle. So every feast, God's perfect number is seven. So there are seven candlesticks, you know, uh, there are uh, there are seven, um, you know, uh, vials. There are everything uh, under the, uh, in the kingdom of God. Seven is a complete number. Man is a seventh, uh, you know, man was uh, made on the sixth day. It was a complete number of God and seven day God rested. So God has everything very precisely planned and systematically laid out in his kingdom that, the people of God will walk in a structure. God has God is a God of a structure and ordinance. He is not a God of chaos. So everything is just very orderly. Now, when we look at the true meaning of Pentecost, Pentecost is the 50th day after the Passover. The first fruit of the barley harvest was waved before the Lord, and Sabbath, this will be on a Sabbath, it will be a day of Pentecost. This is the day God visited his people of Israel as a first encounter when they left Egypt. If you remember when they left Egypt, that was that year that God visited them in a very special way. And that is the year that they began to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Now, during the Feast of Pentecost, everything that I'm, I'm saying to you today has symbolically has a meaning and it ties to the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, 
they will take two loaves of leaven bread. What is a leaven bread? When the Israelites will bake bread, it will be either leaven bread or unleavened bread. Leaven mean, meaning that they will add yeast to it. Unleavened means there will not be yeast added to it. So now yeast symbolizes sin. When they wave the two loaves of the leavened bread before God to celebrate the day of Pentecost, it is talking about two nations coming together. The nations that God is going to bring together was a people that are not being saved yet. They are still living in sin. They symbolically mean that God is going to redeem them, both Gentile and also the Jews. The Jews was the first one that God opened the door that they will walk into the kingdom of God, followed by the Gentile. Now, Pentecost was the day God brought Israel from Egypt and showed himself powerfully at Mount Sinai and gave the covenant to his people. That was the first Pentecost. We must understand that long before people celebrated the Pentecost Sunday in the upper room, God already ordained the first feast of Pentecost at Mount Sinai when he gave the commandments to Moses and he met the people with a thunder and fire from Mount Sinai. Pentecost simply meaning bringing a new man on the face of this earth. Pentecost means 50th. Now Leviticus 23, 15 to 22, you would read that the, the feast of Pentecost will last for two days. That will be from the sunset at six o'clock on Friday to the sunset of a Sunday at six o'clock. It will be a, a 48 hours celebration throughout the land of Israel. Now, if you would read, let's read Leviticus 3, verse 15. The Bible says, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. That means it's going to be 50 days after the feast of Passover is Pentecost. It was on the day for the first time the Holy Ghost will fall in an upper room in Jerusalem. Symbolically, when, uh, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law, God met him with a fire. The first encounter was Mount Sinai, when God appeared to Moses as a fire, and he gave the commandments to Moses on the day of Pentecost. And on the second time, it was in the upper room in Jerusalem. So in both places, if you would observe very carefully, there were two things. Number one, the Spirit of God from heaven descended. God's presence came to meet the people and to open the gateway for them to be part of his plan and his kingdom. That was the first thing. And number two, fire was present. The first encounter was in Mount Sinai, 50 days after Passover. The second encounter was in the upper room in Jerusalem, 50 days exactly after the resurrection. God did not even miss that one single day. If we would count, God has everything in number. Praise God. Even today, there are many scholars are believing that the Lord is going to come back on the day of Pentecost because this was the day before the harvest. That is uh, the, the belief and the accepting because, in fact, Jesus said that when the fig tree put out his leaf, then you know the time, the season that you are looking for. It is talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. So we know that when the fig tree put out his leaf, it signifies that the feast of harvest has begun. Praise God. So in both places, there were new beginning for his people. Leviticus 23, verse 17 says, You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and there shall be fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. That means they will add yeast to it. They are the first fruit unto the Lord. So when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, they were the first fruit. It symbolically means they were the first fruit. 
So when God took the 12 apostles and with all the believers and took them to the upper room, they were the, um, the, 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 the prophetically uh, ordained the first fruit of God spoken uh, uh, that came to fulfillment. Praise God. So the Feast of Pentecost is tied up to the harvest because of the first fruit offering. I want you to understand that the harvest and the Feast of Pentecost, it goes together. It is so important. Without the uh, uh, harvest, there will not be a Pentecost. Without the first fruit of the harvest, there will not be a Pentecost. What it signifies there, that there will be a, a harvest prior to a Pentecost. A feast of Pentecost is connected to the feast of harvest. The harvest will proceed after the uh, Pentecost. So the word Pentecost simply means Shavuot. Shavuot means in Hebrew, it means harvest. Praise God. When God took the people of Israel out of Egypt, there was a harvest. Now, when God took the 120 to the upper room, there was a harvest of the first fruit of the people in the upper room. Praise God. In the final day of the closing hour of Jesus Christ going to come back, there's going to be the gathering, the Bible says, in the book of Ezekiel from the four corners of the world, from the north, south, east, and the west. At the blowing of the trumpet, the Son of Man shall descend from the clouds, and he will gather the people from all, the, from all corners of the world. He talks about that's going to be the final harvest. And on the day that they're going to celebrate the final harvest, there's going to be the, 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 the Pentecost. Or the Pentecost is going to be the, not only God is going to go, come forth and show for themselves. That's what the Bible says, when he come back again in Mount Olive, there's going to be thunder, there's going to be lightning. And the whole world is going to see the coming of our great King. Praise God. Hallelujah. And no one has the excuse on the face of this earth, to tell that I have never heard the gospel. Nobody preached to me. The Bible says that this gospel will be preached to the end of this world, and then the coming of the Lord will take place. So the gospel will be preached, and the coming of Jesus Christ is going to take place, where the gathering of the people is going to come from the four corners of the world, and the trumpet sound. Praise God. Praise God. So when we look historically, what God has done throughout the ages of mankind for 6,000 years, everything God did it according to his journal book. Nothing went out of his journal book. Everything recorded precisely to his pro pro prophecy and his uh, prophetical word that came forth. Now, there are two phases. The phase one of Pentecost was uh, when the nation of Israel formed as a nation. You see, uh, from the time they came out from Egypt, they were celebrating for over 2,000 years. And at the time that Israel became a nation, in May 14, 1948, Jew became a nation of Israel. This was one week before Pentecost, exactly on the day of the Feast of Harvest. God was so precise. He was on the dot. Nothing happens without the structure and the planning of God. Everything happens exactly on the dot. It is on the one week before Pentecost. So when they became a nation in Jerusalem in 1948, on the 21st of 1948, the people of Jews celebrated Pentecost. Praise God. This was the first phase. Now, phase two was the birth of the church in the new covenant where God made a new man. In another word, it was the Jewish and the Gentile coming together. Praise God. It happens in the, in the upper room where God gathered them together. God brought the Jewish first. And later on, God opened the doors through Peter to the household of Cornelius. And God opened the doors amen, that the Gentile can partake in the feast of the Pentecost, that the Holy Ghost can fall both 
in the Jew, upon the Jew and also on the Gentile. So it was exactly 10 days before Pentecost, exactly 10 days before Pentecost, the disciples came together and assembled at the upper room on the day of the Feast of Pentecost. This was what the two loaves signifies. The two loaves of the bread represented in the natural, the two different people are coming together on the day of harvest from Pentecost. So the true meaning of Pentecost, not only connected to harvest, but it's also to bring two different kinds of a people together. And it's written in the book of Ephesians 2, 14 to 15. If you would read in the book of Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, the Bible says, for he is our peace, who has made both one, who has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That means God is going to break the wall between all people, and there's going to be one nation, there's going to be one tongue, there's going to be one people that is going to worship and praise him, praise God. Verse 15 says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in our ordinance, for to make in himself the twain one new man. So making peace. That means God is going to bring the bridge between two men, two people, that both the Gentile and the Jews are going to partake in the promises of God. Praise God. Why don't we lift our hands and just thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God for this great privilege because we are not supposed to partake in this. We are the Gentile. We are not, in, originally we were not in the plan of God. But because they rejected, the, the Jews rejected, we partake on the promise of God. Let us thank the Lord for a while. Thank now, the Feast of Pentecost prophetically represent the outpouring, the anointing, the spiritual authority and dominion of the church over the two kingdoms. The kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of man. The kingdom of Satan will lose his power. He will, he will lose his ruling. He will lose whatever dominion on the face of this earth. And the kingdom of man will take over, praise God, replacing the, the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. When man fall, he lost his authority and his walk with God. But on the day of Pentecost, God replaced or renewed that authority back to mankind through the Holy Ghost. When you and I receive the Holy Ghost, the Bible says that we are, praise God, the holy nation, the peculiar people, praise God, praise God, the priesthood, the household of faith unto God. Praise God, what a privilege it is. And right now, the enemy, the devil has been triumphing over the world for 4,000 years until the Holy Ghost fell. But when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, can you imagine all of a sudden the church had a new authority? They had a new power. They become the sons and the daughters of God. They become the prince and the princess of God. All of a sudden the devil has lost his triumphing ruling rulership over the world. And the rulership is being transferred to the sons and the daughters of God because of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost is a seal of salvation. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you must be born again of the water and the spirit. He was just not talking about the salvation. This is a salvation plan. But I want you to understand, it is a transformation plan. It is a plan to transform you and me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is to bring about a new people that will walk in authority. You and I don't have to walk in defeat. You and I don't have to walk in failure. You, don't, you and I don't have to walk under the attack of the enemy. But God empowers us with a new authority, with a new power with a new anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. What a great privilege it is. Praise God. There are many religions in this world. They can come and they can debate to us and they can bring the ideology. They can bring their debate and they can debate to Christianity based on the scriptures 
of whatever theology that they have, but one thing that they cannot debate, they cannot debate against the Holy Ghost because they never had the power. They have never experienced the power. They do not know the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking to a group of people that have been filled, that have been empowered, that have been set free by the power of the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm talking about. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it was just not a man's teaching. The day that the Holy Ghost fell upon you and you spoke in a different tongue, when you magnified Jesus Christ, it was an experience out of this world. Nobody can deny that. Nobody can say that this is not of God. This is just of man. You cannot tell that this is not of God. Because when a child of God experiences a true transformation, when God put a seal on you, it is a seal of a spirit. It is a seal of the fire of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. When you spoke in tongues, I remember when I was in Form 6, Praise God. That was the time that I was filled with the Holy Ghost. When God filled us amen, in the camp meeting, praise God. It was an experience like none other. Praise God. For one week, we were in a different atmosphere. I did not go to school. I did not go to any kind of a campaign or anything. For one week, we shut ourselves celebrating and worshiping and praising this great experience of salvation that Jesus brought to us. It was a great celebration when people of God were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about a group of people that when the Lord filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it was a great, great experience that we cannot deny. Hallelujah. Yes, you spoke in tongues. Yes, you magnify God. But, before, but more than that, when the Holy Ghost fell upon you, it was an experience like a fire shut in your bones. That's why the Bible says it is like a fire shut in your bones. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. To be filled with the Holy Ghost, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is so vital. It is both for the salvation. And also, praise God, to liberate a group of people that would be part of the kingdom of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. The Jewish believe that every time there is a feast, whenever the feast, there will be a sacrifice. When they offer, offer up the sacrifice, I mentioned to you about the seven feasts, they believe that from the city of Jerusalem, there's going to be an open heaven. The rabbis of the Old Testament believe as the sacrifice goes up to heaven, the throne or the heavens of God is placed directly above Jerusalem. That's what they believe. That's why when the rabbis offer up offering, they believe that when they lift up the peace offering, they bring him and praise God, the offering unto God, the first fruit of offering, the, the, the offering of incense will ascend directly to the throne of God. And there will be an open heaven. God will open the heaven. And God will pour out his blessing and his presence upon the face of this earth. On the day of Pentecost, if you would remember what happened on the day of Pentecost. There was an open heaven at the upper room. And on the upper room, as though the clouds came apart. The heavens came apart. And all of a sudden, God poured out his spirit on the upper room. When you read Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, and all of a sudden, there was a mighty rushing wind. Praise God. Where does the wind come from? Praise God. They have no idea where it came from. It blew into the upper room, and it filled Everyone in the place they were sitting, they were filled first of all with a wind from heaven. There was an open heaven. When, when the wind began to blow, all of a sudden there was a fire that would be released from heaven. This was a holy fire, the same fire that God released through Moses on Mount Sinai 
it came and sat upon the people of Israel, upon the 120 of them. And the Bible said not 119 received the Holy Ghost. The Bible did not say 118 received the Holy Ghost, but every one of them were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Praise God and they spoke in tongues as God gave the utterance. Hallelujah. Man does not give you the utterance. Nobody give the utterance. When God give you the utterance, it is from the throne. And that's why nobody can deny this is an experience from heaven. Nobody can fight the argument and say Christianity is just another religion. They cannot say there are 3,000 over religion in this world today, but they cannot come to you and say, look, this is just another religion. And you can point to the Holy Ghost and say, I have received something from heaven. I have received the tongues from heaven. Praise God. It is not just a tongue of man. Praise God. They say in this world, they have more than 5,000 tongues. But there is one tongue, one is language, the language of the heaven that the angel understand, that the heavenly host understand. Praise God. When all the angels will stand before God, the seven, seven hierarchy, praise God, of the of angels, the archangels, the, the seraphims, the cherubims, all the angels that stand before God, they will understand when you speak in tongues. Praise God. That's why when you begin to pray in tongues, it is so powerful. It penetrates through three kingdoms. The kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of man, and into the kingdom of God. Nobody can understand when you pray in tongues, but God understands that language. The heavenly hosts understand sometimes you can never receive answer for your prayer in your normal prayer. But when you all of a sudden tune in to that, that uh, frequency of, of the Holy Ghost and tune in and speak in tongues, all of a sudden you receive, praise God, the answer for the prayer that you've been praying for. What a mighty, powerful God that we serve. And what a mighty, powerful, praise God, promise that he has given to us on this day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. On the day of Pentecost, there were heaven open in upper room. Praise God. We were in, in one, one time, we were in, a, I think I told you the story, we were in Orissa. In Orissa, uh, North India, it is a mountainous people. They, it's people that, you know, are tribal people. They've never been to school, you know, and, and, and some of them are very illiterate. They have, do not know how to read and write. And uh, the churches were closed for 10 years because of persecution. Amen. Uh, and uh, we made a team with the uh, Singapore church, with Brother Bobby's church, with Sister Sandra. And there were about 14 teams that went to Orissa with us. And they said, for 10 years, the churches were closed. And over hundreds of uh, pastors were killed. Churches were burned. And uh, because of the, 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 the group of Hinduism came, and they closed down the churches in Orissa because so many people are getting converted to Christianity. So that was the first year that the churches are being opened after 10 years. Can you imagine for 10 years, the people did not have a place of gathering. So we brought 157 pastors, Trinitarian pastors, and we had a three days of seminar of teaching them of oneness and Jesus name baptism and the plan of salvation to them. Praise God. And every evening we would go to the mountainous area. We would travel into the mountain two hours, three hours, and we would just have a meeting in the mountainous people. And we would have evangelistic service. And I remember in one of the evangelistic service, praise God, all of a sudden after the worship, the people all of a sudden, praise God, lift up their hands and they began to worship the Lord. As they worship the Lord, I think over about 200 or 300 people in that uh, wooden hut, the Holy Ghost fell on them. The Holy Spirit fell on them. And all of them were speaking, many of them, children, all people were speaking in tongues for the first time. They were speaking in tongues the first time, but something powerful began to take place as they were speaking in tongues. 
all of a sudden my wife turned back and said, look at that old woman, at the old lady. She was probably about 75 years old. She said, look at her. She is speaking in a fluent English. And, 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 and then we, we got puzzled. We said, this is an old tribal woman. Where she, did she learn to speak in English? And then, we, and then all of a sudden, Sister Sandra ran and said, there's another lady here. There's another man here who's speaking in English. And then we called the pastor. We said, did all these women went to school to learn English? And the pastor said, no, they never been to school and they do not know what is English is all about. Over, over 20 of our people were speaking and they were not just speaking the normal English. They were speaking in fluent, profi uh, pro proficient English and magnified Jesus Christ in a powerful way. Praise God, praise God, praise God. What does that tell you and tell me? Praise God, the author of all language, the author of all things. God is the author. And when he fills people, he has given us, praise God, tongues as a sign of the people that coming together. Praise God. When you know the story in Tower in, in Babel, when they erected the Tower of Babel, God dispersed them because they were coming together for the wrong reason. And God dispersed them. And they, God brought many, many tongues. God brought many nations were created. Many languages were created. Many people, there were over so many thousands of nations that, were, that came on that day. But on the day of Pentecost, there were no longer many languages. There were no longer many nations. There were only one language. There were only one nation. It is a nation, praise God, of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. When you and I go to heaven one day, we are not, I believe we are not probably going to speak English. Probably we are not going to speak in Spanish. Maybe we're not going to speak in Bahasa Malaysia. Maybe in Tamil. That's going to be one language. Praise God. Minds well today, you practice to speak in tongues. Every time you get into prayer, begin to speak in tongues. That's why Paul said, I speak in tongues more than anyone. I speak in tongues more than any people. Praise God. Tongues is so powerful. And God has given that as a sign to us. Praise God. Now look at the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 to verse 13. When John the Baptist came, he was a forerunner for Jesus Christ. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He will baptize you the Holy Ghost. Now, the baptizer is none other than Jesus Christ. That's why when he stood at the shores of Jerusalem before he was resurrected, he looked to the people. He, he breathed to them. Symbolically, he breathed to them. He said, receive the Holy Ghost. He said, do not depart until you receive the Holy Ghost in Jerusalem. And he breathed unto them. And it was the breath of life. When God breathed in the Garden of Eden, it was the breath of life that brought Adam and Eve into existence. But when Jesus breathed the breath of the Holy Ghost again in Jerusalem before he was taken up to heaven, on the day after he was resurrected, it was the breath of resurrection and the Holy Ghost signifying, praise God, that the Holy Ghost will be poured out on the day of Pentecost. Praise God. Praise God. That's why you read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, when, when, when the, prophet, the prophecy was said, but he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you. Praise God. Power to live an overcoming life. Power to overcome every sin. Power to become a testimony unto God. Praise God, and it shall be witness unto me. The greatest, greatest calling that God can give to you, that God can give to me after we have received the Holy Ghost is not to be an evangelist, is not to be a preacher, is not to be a missionary. That is secondary. But the greatest, greatest calling of all is to be a witness. Praise God. Witness of what God has done for you. 
what the blood of Jesus has done for you. That is the greatest thing that we can share. Praise God. Now Ezekiel 36, 26 says something will happen when the Holy Ghost is poured upon you and me. Something powerful is going to take place. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. It said God is going to give a new heart. He's going to take away the stony heart and he's going to give you a heart of flesh. Read uh, Ezekiel 36, 26. He said, and I'm going to give you a new spirit and I'm going to put within you and I'm going to take away the stony heart from your flesh and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. That means God is going to remove every stubbornness, every rebellion, every sin, every wickedness that the Old Testament people could not have. And God is going to place that because when the when the covenant was given in the Old Testament, when the commandment was given in the Old Testament, it was given in the written form. God, it took God, it took the finger of God to write on the tablets and give the people <coughs> the Ten Commandments. It was the finger of God that wrote on the tablets and gave it to the people. But on the day of Pentecost, it took the same finger of God to write not on a tablet of a stone, but it wrote upon the heart of a man. That's what Ezekiel says. I'm going to give you a heart of a flesh. I'm going to remove that stone from you, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. <clears throat> Praise God. They can break the, the tablet stone, but they cannot remove, they cannot break Whatever that is written in the heart of man, praise God. A man, a woman of God, a man, a woman that have tasted the goodness of God, they can backslide, but they cannot deny. They can come to the place, they can say, and they can walk out of God, and they can say that, amen, the world have taken me, and they can backslide, but they cannot deny what Jesus has done for them. Because what God has done to them, according to the book of Ezekiel, he has written the commandment in their hearts forever. And that commandment is going to be until eternity. Praise God. Everything God has written is going to stand as a testimony on the day of atonement in eternity. God cannot pluck the heart out of, out of, of a human being and say, I don't need this commandment. I don't need this. When they receive the Holy Ghost, they receive the commandments into their hearts. What a powerful way God has given the commandment back to the church. Oh, people of God, hallelujah. We don't have an excuse. Once we have received the Holy Ghost, we don't have an excuse not to live as a child of God. We don't have an excuse to, to God and say, that the world has deceived me. The devil has deceived me. The work of the flesh has deceived me. We cannot give an excuse to God on that day because our, our heart is going to speak out. Our heart is going to say that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Praise God. Your heart is going to speak out as a written word of the commandment on the day. Praise God. We cannot deceive. That's why the words say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Your heart will be filled so much that it will speak out the word that is written in your heart. Praise God. It was so profound what Ezekiel said on that day. I'm going to take away the stony heart. And I'm going to give you a heart of a flesh, a heart that has been baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's what Pentecost is all about. Pentecost is just not a celebration of another celebration. Pentecost is a new day, is a new coming, is a transformation, praise God, of a people that are coming together under the power, anointing, under the cloud of the Holy Ghost. It is very powerful. It is very powerful. Now, when Moses encountered with the fire in Exodus 3, chapter 1 to chapter 3, verse 1 to 17, there are four things that took place. 
when Moses encountered the fire. Number one, the appeared a flame of fire. When you and I received the Holy Ghost, the Lord filled us and baptized us with the fire of the Holy Ghost. You must remember the day you received the Holy Ghost. You cannot shut your mouth. You want to testify to everybody. You want to witness to everybody. You want to be the first one to go up to the pulpit and testify what the Lord had done for you. You want to be the first one that stick the nose out and say, Jesus is so good. You'll be the first one and say, there is no God like our God. Because there is a fire that's shut in our bones. There is a fire that's baptized in our spirit. That is a baptism of the spirit. Praise God. Praise God. We need to allow the fire of God to continue to mold us because this fire is the only assurity for us to get out of this world when Jesus come back. When the Lord is going to come back, he's going to look for a mark of a people that are going to carry the fire. Praise God. You remember the virgin, the ten virgin. Five were foolish, five were wise. They have lost the oil. People of God, don't lose the oil of anointing. Don't lose the presence of God. Don't lose the fire of God. If you don't have the fire of God, if you don't have the anointing, pray God, send me the oil. We need the oil of the anointing today. Get back and trim your lamp and say, God, fill my lamp with the oil of the Holy Ghost. Don't be satisfied with the things of this world. Don't be satisfied with the material thing of this world. Don't be satisfied with what we have in this world today that are so temporary that we could miss out the great things in the spirit world. But as God, Lord, fill my lamp with the oil, Lord. Praise God. Number two, it lit up the place where Moses was standing. When the fire of the Holy Ghost falls upon you, when the fire of the Holy Ghost falls upon Moses, it radiant, it brought the radiant around. Praise God. There were people that standing with Moses saw something powerful is taking place. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you know, during Brother Stark's time, during the camp meeting, there were many, many testimony. When people received the Holy Ghost, their face were lit up like a thousand bolts of light. They were radiant of God's glory would come upon them. And they would testify that it was such a powerful, powerful transformation when the Holy Ghost fall upon you people around you will recognize something powerful have taken place people cannot deny the experience that you and I have received people of God we need to walk in the radiant of the Holy Ghost don't let the light go out don't let the radiant of the Holy Ghost let out praise God the Bible say the light shineth into the darkness and the darkness comprehended not every place that we walk into Praise God, the darkness will be pushed out because the light of God is inside of us. Sometimes you don't have to open your mouth and testify to any some, some people. All you have to do is just to show up in the Holy Ghost. All you have to do is show up in the presence of the Holy Ghost. That's enough. It will bring a great, great conviction into the hearts of people. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I was one time, amen, taking Brother Charles to see a doctor one time. We were in the midst of a doctor, and all of a sudden, the doctor began to cry. He said, I do not know why. There is something about the presence. I felt something among you, too. He said, I feel like crying and weeping. There's something. I feel a great peace coming into this place. Inside of a clinic, there are people who testified, when you bring the glory of God with you, when you bring the peace of God with you, you bring the radiant glory of God into the presence of darkness. But we need to endure and walk in the glory of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Number three, as you draw nearer, the fire preeminent is hard. When we walk every day, it is not enough that we receive the Holy Ghost just one day. That we celebrate, we receive the Holy Ghost once a year, once a month, but we need to be filled again and again and again with the baptism of the Holy Ghost every time in our private prayer. We need to go before God and say, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Let me speak with a new tongue. 
Let me know you. Praise God. The Bible said those that are known as the sons of God will be led by the Spirit of God. If we have so much of God in us, praise God. We will be led of the Spirit of God. Now the love of God is spread in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Brother Stark used to say, do you know how to measure how much love we have? How that we can love our enemy? How we can put down our life to, for our brothers and sisters? The measurement ruler is how much we have the Holy Ghost inside of us. He used to say that, measure the Holy Ghost inside of us. The more Holy Ghost we have in us, the more the love of God. It is not easy to say that I want to lay my life for my brother. It is not easy to show your right cheek when somebody slap you on your left cheek. It is not easy to take off your coat when somebody asks you for your shirt. It is not easy for you to walk for 10 miles when somebody wants you to walk for one mile. It is not easy, but it is possible with the Holy Ghost. When we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, it is possible. Praise God. We need to measure in the yardstick of the Holy Ghost. The more that we have the Holy Ghost, the more that we are transformed under the power of the Holy Ghost. Finally, praise God. The fire radiates the holiness of God. Today, many people are afraid of holiness. Many people fight the holiness and secretly they fight. The first sign of people are falling away from God is when they draw themselves away from the holiness of God. They secretly do things that are against the word of God. They secretly go against the holiness of God. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see God. Praise God. Now, holiness, amen, it is just not a standard of an organization. It is a standard of a holy God. That's why the Bible calls the Spirit of God as a Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he wants to make you holy. That's why the, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. If you only know that the Holy Ghost is, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We will be careful what we speak. We will be careful what we see in the media. We will be careful when we hear the gossip. We will be careful what we speak to our brothers and sisters because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But in order for us to be the temple of the Holy Ghost, we need to be filled again and again with a fire. Without the fire of the Holy Ghost, it will be impossible.